Hey everyone, Eric Watson here, freelance writer, player of games, writer of words, recorder of videos, and tabletop role-playing aficionado. Welcome to the DMs Guild review, my written and video view series. Take a look at the adventures and supplemental material at the Dungeon Masters Guild website. This video will be reviewing the Bestiary Supplement, The Book of Monstrous Kennings, a Norse Bestiary, designed by Thieves Can't Games, aka Evan Jackson, for Dungeons & Dragons 5th Edition. A review copy has been provided for the purposes of this review. If you enjoy my content, consider using my affiliate links for your online shopping and supporting me via patreon.com slash roguewatson. God of War, Skyrim, The Banner Saga, Assassin's Creed Valhalla. What do all these games have in common? They're all great games. <laughs> but the point I'm making is they are all inspired or drawn from the rich tapestry that is Norse mythology. Uh, I'm not an expert on Norse mythology by any means, but as somebody who enjoys the fantasy genre and obviously enjoys Dungeons and & Dragons and recognizes that a lot of those uh, creatures and uh, figures and myths stem from all these different you know, real-world sources, and obviously Norse mythology is a really, really cool one. Now, off the top of my head, I can only name... Uh, Jormungandir, um, Draugr from Skyrim, uh, Valkyries, the, the warrior women, and, you know, words like Ragnarok and Valhalla and stuff. That's pretty much, so I am not a expert on Norse mythology, but I think it's really cool. I would say that I'm, I'm very much uh, into it, and this book provides 40 uh, creature stat blocks based on, from what I can tell, very, very well-researched and well-written uh, from Norse mythology, including um, famous figures as well as more generic stat blocks uh, that those figures might come from. For example, Fafnir is a a lindworm, which is a basically a giant flightless dragon creature, and so we get the stat block for the lindworms, generic, you know, generically, and then we also get the stat block for Fafnir. Um, one thing to note, and this isn't really a pro or a con, but just an, a, an important observation to make is that uh, this tends toward the upper echelon of creatures. So usually we get a pretty good variety of uh, CRs, which this one, I guess, kind of has it. If you if you look at the appendix, it's got broken down by CR, and it kind of has, um, you know, a mix from everything from, like, CR1 all the way to 26 or 28 or something. But uh, really, it only has a fourth of the creatures are even Tier 1. And if you really think about it, a lot of D&D is only played in probably Tier 1, maybe Tier 2, and a lot of campaigns, I mean, look at the 5th edition published campaigns, are ending by the time we get to early Tier 3. Whereas in this case, I mentioned only about 25%, a quarter of the monster is actually even appropriate for Tier 1, and uh, the other 25% is like strictly Tier 4 and above, like epic, mythic, gargantuan, world-ending threats, which is appropriate. So I'm not knocking this... Uh, supplement for doing that but just you need to go ahead of time like not, maybe not necessarily plug these monsters into your everyday campaign but instead uh, you could build a very high level threat campaign around especially if you want to use specific like super powerful crazy powerful monsters and um, the designer also use mythic monsters which were introduced in uh, mythic odysseys of theros which is you take an already really powerful you know end game uh, boss type stat block that has uh, you know legendary actions and traits and regional things and all of that layer actions and then on top of that you give them a mythic trait and mythic actions which is typically when they are reduced to zero hit points they basically do the video game boss thing bullshit which is they suddenly rise up and go to phase two where they regain usually about half their hit points and then gain new abilities the you know battle music changes to be even more epic <laughs> and you have to fight this battle all over again and it's and and basically is is equivalent to fighting that monster again so you like double the cr threat which is only appropriate for like extreme high level uh combat and yes you'll see that for uh like jormungandir and um Benrir and and all these like really powerful, cool world ending threats. So if you're hoping to see what those things look like in 5e, I will show you. And I think it's really impressive and a cool product if you are into Norse mythology creatures. Uh, for example, the Elv variant, Elven variants are called the Alfar, and uh, they are divided into technically light elves and dark elves. But in this case, the designer uh, explains that. 
the Light Elves or the Lyosulfur. By the way, could we please get a pronunciation guide? Because I am just going to trip over this. There's a lot of... It's a cool language. It's a really neat language. It's, it's very... Um, I, you know, poetic sounding, and but it's it's just really difficult without some kind of pronunciation guard, uh, guide. I know that J's sound like um, like Y's and E's. That's about all I know. The Leo so far are the light elves, which are actually more like ASM ASMR in a way. They're more celestial. And then you've got the dark elves, which are the Dokolfir, which are more like dwarves, um, not necessarily like evil dark elves. And, and neither of them are really like good or evil necessarily. So. Kind of a cool, and and there uh, we do get uh, player options for creating these variant elves uh, that are more based on Norse uh, mythology. And by the way, amazing artwork. It looks incredibly put together. Um, not every creature gets original art like the Monster Manual Expanded 3 does. It's not quite on that level, but there is a lot of really great art by artist Matt Forsyth, uh, who has produced, from what I can tell, maybe 60 to 75% of the interior illustrations here. There is some stock art being used to kind of fill, you know, some of the gaps of maybe the more least interesting monsters. Like there's, you know, the Nordic equivalent of merfolk and the Nordic equivalent of like winter wolves that are not too interesting. But the ones that are very interesting and unique, uh, and that's a lot of humanoids and giants, but still, I mean, art like this looks just absolutely incredible. Just really pulls the whole thing together. In the case of these uh, humanoid L variants, we do get multiple stat blocks for different um, power levels, which is very nice to see. Um, the Draugr, as I mentioned, is one of the few that I recognize just based on Skyrim, which in Skyrim they were like zombies with weapons, which is almost more like whites at that point, although I think whites are actually um, more intelligent. But the Draugr here is a CR9, by the way, and again, I'm, I'm picturing like just a, a minion type undead. CR9 is, is very, very powerful, and that's indicative of how this whole Nordic mythology book um, ends up adapting these um, unique creatures into 5e is they basically make them fairly high level. So that's, you know, partly what I was saying is, is get ready for some pretty powerful creatures. In this case, it can make, um, two attacks and one of its attacks can actually grapple people. And then it can also, uh, teleport and hide in darkness, which is a really cool kind of unique, uh, power set for a, what looks like a, a standard white, and then, as I mentioned, when you've got um, a few more uh, famous creatures, there might be a case where the, uh, the, the we get the generic stat block, which is the Draugr here, and then we get the special stat block, which is uh, Thrain, the Draugr Lord, who has all these extra abilities, got legendary actions, and wields a very powerful uh, sword, which can do extra things. For example, if he gets a crit and then rolls another 20, he just immediately decapitates somebody, just straight up death. Uh, which is pretty neat. I love seeing enemies with their own unique magic items. We don't get a whole lot of that here. There's only two magic items included. One of them are the chains that the, the actual chains that bind um, Fenris, I think is his name, the giant wolf. And then the other one is the uh, Mistletane, which is the sword that Thrain here uses, uh, who has also layer actions and legendary actions. Uh, and I don't think we get mythic traits for you, but we do on some of the bigger ones. Um, I also look, whenever I'm looking at these supplements, on how... Um, interesting the stat blocks are like yes i obviously want you know unique looking creatures um but do they have different kind of abilities or are we just transposing things that are kind of already available in the monster manual uh, in the case of the haugbui which is some kind of like ghoul type undead creature that um, haunts usually a certain burial uh, this one also can grapple when it attacks, and if it is grappling you, it can rend your flesh, which um, basically does the same attack, but um, reduces your maximum hit points, which is always a really scary, horrible thing for players to deal with. And for the Brunmingi, again, no idea if I'm pronouncing these correctly or not, um, it gets a lot of uh, rogue abilities. It's this fox-like creature, just a asshole really <laughs> so one of its one of its things is it's a well pisser which means it just corrupts and taints like uh areas and it just is nasty uh it gets cutting action and evasion which are like rogue abilities and then has a special uh venom spray which i guess is its way of doing like kind of a skunk spray uh in a 15 foot cone um so this is an example of one that i straight up looked up how to pronounce because i've i've seen this word before and i've never known how to actually pronounce it it is apparently pronounced ein harriar the Einherjar warriors, which are the the ghost warriors that embody um, uh, the Valhalla and will come whenever Ragnarok happens. And then these ghostly warriors, uh, it's what it basically is what you uh, what you want to have happen if you die in the field of glorious battle, then you become an Einherjar. 
uh, which we are given stat blocks here, and they are um, said they are celestials and not, not necessarily undead. They are they've been ascended into this kind of sort of angelic form, really. This is like angels for uh, for the Norse mythology, which is always awesome. Like right, like it it, it makes uh, it translates so perfectly to fantasy RPG, so it works beautifully. And of course, there's the Valkyrie later on. We'll get to which have an ability to actually raise these. Uh, minions up and even then I say minion it's still a CR3 like these are still powerful creatures with all kinds of abilities they've got runic weapons which means they get a plus one to attack they've got the reckless stats they can take advantage um, on uh, they get extra radiant damage if they hit as a bonus action like just pumped full of extra abilities even at CR3 like you are really really average of 50 hit points and then we get a, another stat block if you want to use somebody even more powerful for a CR8 when represented by a hero all right now we're gonna get into the really fun stuff which are the world ending threats which in my opinion is why you're gonna get this book um, yes it's fun to use Norse mythology creatures but really the reason you want the supplement is because you want these awesome high level mythic threats to be able to unleash on your players they are very uh, well written in terms of uh, introducing me to these creatures. You know, if I have no prior knowledge of Norse mythology whatsoever, it does a fun job of kind of explaining as like a Cliff Notes version of of what these things are. And I'm actually going to read you a bit of a uh, section here under uh, Fenrir about the binding of Fenrir. Um, armed with the knowledge of destiny, the Aesir sought to bring. And by the way, again, I'm going to just trip over all these pronunciations. Aesir sought to bind Fenrir and so limit the desolation he could bring about. Enlisting the help of the dwarven smiths Broker and Eitri, the gods obtained an unbreakable magical chain called Glipnir. The chain was thin as spider's thread and appeared nothing more than a fine silk ribbon. Suspicious of the gods' motives and challenging him to break the ribbon, the mighty Fenrir agreed to be bound so long as he could hold Tyr's hand with his jaws as his insurance against deception. Henceforth, Tyr was known as the one-handed god. <laughs> That's such a funny, well-written uh, description of this uh, mythical threat. And obviously, it has an insane stat block of CR twenty six. It can it it's got it can bite uh, three times per turn, and each time it bites, it can also do different things with the person it's got in its jaws. It can just shake them, which means it tosses them sixty feet, including into other people or into walls, taking extra damage. It can then devour them, swallow them, and do extra damage there. It's got this high level frightful presence. But once its mythic trait. If you want to um, unlock its mythic trait, it doesn't die when it's reduced to zero hit points. Instead, it regains 300 hit points, flames burn from its eyes and nostrils, and its bite attacks do an additional 2d12 damage, and it gains mythic actions, including Bang Ruin, which costs three actions, where it uh, just does a horrifying howl. You get a DC 15 con saving throw, or you straight up drop to zero hit points. It is just a killer howl. And I like the fact the designer even explains that, like, hey, I wanted to make this a really powerful ability, but I also gave it some uh, balancing features by making it A, only 30 feet around the creature, and B, a, a relatively tame saving throw for the point at which you should be facing this creature, which is a DC 15. But then it mentions if you want to even go back from that, you know, you can have him just take damage instead of having it be a, a straight up kill shot, or make sure your players know ahead of time, maybe they've done some research on this creature before they face it, and... You know, they know about some of those weaknesses, the fact that it's only got a 30-foot range other things. Also want to read you the actual flavor text, which is included for when this thing goes into uh, mythic mode. The walls of the fens let loose a baleful howl. His ravening jaws spread wide. His upper fangs seem to touch the very sky, even as his lower jaw meets the dust of the burning earth. The world darkens, unlit by sun or stars. The ground heaves, wrecked by quakes and tremors as mountains shatter, vast shards of stone crashing to the earth. Trees tear loose from their roots, casting soil in the air as they rip free and fall, all while the wolf looks on, grinning with satisfaction. Red flames flare and burn from the great beast's eyes and nostrils as it advances once more, hot spittle dripping from its slavering maw. That's awesome. <laughs> I love it. Uh, really, really cool uh, example of just a, a, a mythical creature done very well, obviously drawn and inspired from... Um, what relatively known creatures again even i just have a, a tangential experience with you know creatures basically based on playing fantasy rpgs and i i could recognize the giant wolf and of course the serpent that devours the world yorming deer which we'll get there in a second um we do get some celestial type creatures as well there's a few fey they i guess every culture has its um version of the seductive fey woman that like lures people into their death um poor lonely men out in the woods or out on the sea or something we get a few of those um, this one is kind of cool, which is the Filgia, which are, uh, reminds me of, oh, what's that series called? The, um, 
God, I can't remember now. The one where the uh, Lyra has the dish. <laughs> I can't remember. Um, the Golden Compass series, whatever that's called. Anyway, um, his Dark Materials. There we go. Boom. Um, where everybody has their soul is represented by this physical creature that lives outside of their body. Um, that's what this Philgia is, basically. And it, it, there's a cool variant for if you want to have that, if your players want to have that, where you literally share your soul with this, essentially as a familiar, but it's not a familiar. It, it mentions the fact that it doesn't have technically the familiar rules. And the fact that it literally shares hit points with you, which makes it a very interesting way of like, hey, do you want to use this creature in combat and a scout? Because... The whatever whatever things happen to it happen to you directly, or you can have it be a cool like you know, part of a character story where it's like maybe their soul is ripped out and put into this creature, and here's the rules for using that. That's a really neat idea. So I didn't know that. I have no idea that was a Norse mythology thing. Um, I thought his art materials came up with all that. So that's that's a really cool uh, aspect right there. Um, Garmir is apparently the Norse's version of Cerberus, the hound that guards the gates of hell. Uh, which I one of the other things, few things I knew about Norse mythology based on a lot of Thor comics and things is that hell, of course, spelled with uh, one L. Um, we've got giant eagles. We've got a, a boar that was forged, uh, literally forged as a construct um, to defeat Loki. Giant serpents. Man, the Norse are really into their giant serpents. Um, every every half the monsters are just some kind of serpentine lizard um, threats, including these literally gargantuan titan creatures. And these aren't even the world-ending mythic threats. I mean, the threats, they still have CR 22, 23, but they're not even the crazy, like, Jormungadir ones, so those are really fun to see. Um, again, these are the kind of seductive uh, fey creatures that I guess every culture needs to have. All right, Jormungandir. Now we're going to get to the another really cool one. Uh, this one, and what's really fun is that, you know, not all of them, the idea behind the mythic transformations is, yes, they all go from uh, zero to then healing up and something new happens, but it's not just the same for every creature. So in the case of this one, um, it's hide splits open and you can see, <laughs> it just reminds me so much of a video game. You can see like, uh, these glowing, they're venom sacks, but like those are the, that's what has hit points now. So essentially he goes to zero hit points. He gains these four venom sacks that all have AC of 22 and 100 hit points each. They've all got immune to uh, regular damage. And uh, they've got certain, I mean, they basically have all their own stats. And then he's got his own um, poison breath that he can do. And every time you destroy one of them, his poison breath is reduced a little bit. But essentially, he now gains glowing, like, weak points as a boss, which is really funny. Uh, but effective, I think, and cool, too. And obviously, he's just a gargantuan world serpent. He can, of course, devour people, slam people with his tail, and and exhale all this poison cloud and poison breath. Just a really, really neat idea for how to do uh, mythic creatures very well. Now, I have not reviewed Mythic Odysseys of Theros. It's probably the only, like, 5e product that I haven't covered at this point. So, I, again, I'm not super familiar with how the whole mythic thing works, but I've reviewed a couple of DMs Guild products that uses them now, and I am a huge fan of them. And I also like the way that they're integrated here uh, in this supplement because I am getting such cool ideas for just, again, high-level end campaign threats. If you can work that in there, holy crap, you can literally unleash unleash your Mungandir on your players, which is so freaking cool. Um, giants are obviously a big part of Norse mythology, and it's a... The designer kind of explains that, hey, giants are such a big part of Norse mythology that I literally made a whole nother supplement, which is going to be called uh, the Book of, of Jotnar, which is going to cover all of the uh, giant stuff. So we only get two stat blocks here, which is kind of a bummer because you figure, I was picturing kind of the similar to the those elf variants where we get multiple stat blocks, at least for the couple big giants because they, they play such a big role. In this case, we only get two, which is disappointing, but I can also see why you would want to spin that off into its whole other product because they are such a big part of uh, Nordic mythology. So... I guess we get kind of these two just as to keep people satisfied, but I, I was a little disappointed we didn't get at least a few more giants, but I understand um, they're going to get their own supplement. Um, mentioned earlier about the Lindworms. These are the flightless dragons, including Fafnir, which is a uh, one that I wasn't quite uh, familiar with, but is a more uh, just high-level, uh, recognizable creature from Norse mythology and is a very classic, like, dragon creature where it's got this horde of... of gold and, and treasure and uh, you know kills anybody that gets near it and he's got legendary actions an example of one that has mythic action that is not a CR 20 plus however so you can include mythic uh, actions on creatures that are maybe tier upper tier three versus necessarily like insane stratosphere tier four which is really cool to see so I like that um, not everybody's a winner Mara is just kind of a different version of a night hag marfolk different version of a merfolk you know the, the ones that just and again, and the, the Fae that are kind of the seduction ones, like those aren't really that interesting to me, but 
Um, from what I can tell, the designer has really done a lot of research when it comes to these North, uh, these North myths and these creatures. So if that's a part of them and they've got their own versions of those creatures, then I think that is appropriate to include here. They're just not what the ones that interest me necessarily. Um, Nidhogger is a just straight up fucking giant dragon and he's got an awesome mythic trait. He dwells below Yggdrasil, which fun fact, I do have a giant um, cool uh, mirror that displays Yggdrasil in my living room, which is the world tree. Um, and uh, Nidhogger is the dragon that lurks beneath. And of course it bursts through when Ragnarok happens, this giant war, which that, just a fucking great idea for an incredible high level campaign, by the way, is just to do Ragnarok. Um, and its mythic action is it um, expel, kind of similar to the zombie T-Rex from Tomb Annihilation. It, it can basically vomit up corpses, which then shamble up and attack. Instead of uh, vomiting up a single zombie, however, it, it vomits whites because again, it's a CR 26 creature and it's mythic trait when it happens when it does that it literally just vomits up what is it 1d4 plus 3 whites and then it can do that again as part of its mythic actions just continually spawning uh, which i think whites are like cr3 to 5 they're they're nothing to you know no shake minion so uh really really cool idea for again I, i'm just really enjoying these mythic creatures and mythic um uh actions and all these traits and things it's a really really cool idea and the Valkyries. I'm not a fan of the boob armor. It's something that really needs to... It's just kind of an embarrassing holdout from older fan, fantasy art that we really need to get over. It's sexist. It's dumb. But this is a really cool artwork, I will say that. Um, she looks like she's ready to kick some ass. Um, and the Valkyries, of course, are the, are the uh, warriors who... Um, they actually bring, I believe, the fallen... Uh, people who fell in battle, regular people, uh, into the Valhalla realm where they become Ein, uh, Ein Heriar. So they can uh, create that as part of their actions. They've got a radiant spear they can attack with, and they can instantly like teleport to their Pegasus mounts as a bonus action, which, of course, very classic. They fly around on these cool horses. So awesome, awesome stat blocks all the way around. Yes, I did a double take when I saw Valravin um, for the sole fact that, um, of course, uh, our player Chris is playing a character named Valravin. Nothing to do with this stat block, by the way, or this particular uh creature or person really which is basically a noble who has been transformed into this um just monstrosity that can shapeshift into different forms um you know the one thing we really don't get here which is kind of odd is we don't get any of the gods instead we really just get the uh the creatures so we don't get loki or odin or hella or any of those kind of creatures um but we do get all of the uh, all of the monsters that are involved in Norse mythology. So it does feel a little bit weird that we're lacking in those gods. And yet, gods aren't really normally given stat blocks anyway. So maybe that was part of the reasoning. But while Robin kind of reminded me of a Loki-type creature where it's got those kind of um, shape-shifting magic spells. Um, Varger is just kind of the Norse version of the Winter Wolf. Again, not terribly exciting there. And uh, as I mentioned, we get player options, um, the variant elves, the Alfir, which can uh, are used as the Doc Alfir and the Leo Selfar. <laughs> I hate pronouncing those words. Please give me a pronunciation guide, uh, which is really cool. Basically, if you want to play more Nordic inspired elves as variants, you certainly can. Some legendary magic items, only those two that are involved in the monster stat blocks. Again, I don't expect a bestiary to have magic items. By the way, I am using the pronunciation of bestiary, even though I am aware that it technically reads as bestiary, but... I think we all agree that bestiary is the proper way to pronounce this word. Um, an appendix, which includes all of the monsters in different organizations, which is very, very welcome always with these supplements that include more than like, you know, a dozen monsters. All right, let's go over my pros and cons for the book of monsters kennings. Am I pronouncing that correctly? Uh, pro 40 well researched and interesting creatures drawn from Norse mythology. It's, I, I love a good monster book that has a set, uh, you know, self-imposed restrictive theme. In this case, all monsters are from Norse mythology. Boom, thumbs up, works very well. And, you know, not all of them are super cool, but I appreciate that they're all uh, drawn together with that theme. Bro, awesome new artwork for most monsters. Huge shout out to Matt Forsyth for creating just some amazing art for, as I said, probably about 75% of the art in here is just absolutely incredible. Pro optional mythic traits, as for Mythic Odysseys of Theros, for uber legendary monsters. I think uber is actually a German or I'm not Norwegian, but anyway, um, just really, really impressed with the use of mythic traits and actions, and especially those evocative transformation sequences are really fun to create even more high-level threats that are really worthy of these just titanic creatures. Uh, pro appendices that organize monsters by type, challenge rating, and environment. Very nice to see. Um, just it's easier to look up okay by cr value or even by like environment what are the swamp creatures what are the forest creatures again anything that has over like 12 creatures should, i would very appreciate having those appendices 
and pro player options for creating variant elves based on the Alfir, uh, which are those light elves and dark elves if you want to make some Nordic inspired um, uh, humanoid elven creatures, I suppose. The only con I had on here, uh, you know, I had some complaints here and there that were probably middling, but the only real official con I'm adding is a pronunciation guide is desperately needed here because. Uh, as much as I love Norse mythology, um, a lot of those Nordic terms are not the easiest or intuitive to pronounce for a lot of English speakers, uh, and I, I can imagine it's going to be even more difficult for non-English speakers, so um, please, please include a pronunciation guide for all of these wonderfully, wonderfully named uh, different creatures so I don't have to Google search all of that when I'm doing my reviews. <laughs> Final verdict, the Book of Monsters Kennings features dozens of well-researched Norse creatures for 5e, including several titanic world-ending threats worthy of Ragnarok. Thank you for watching this video review. You can see my written review at roguewantsit.com. You can watch more reviews and follow our own D&D adventures here on my YouTube channel, and you can support my work at patreon.com slash roguewantsit. Shoutouts to Platinum Patrons, Joe, Will, Tiny Dancer, Wizard, Princess, Christopher, Thomas, Captain Mike, Adam, Aiden, Stan, Nathan, Alex, Chad, Alexander, Dan, Daniel, Cam, and the Quizat, Hatterack. Gold Patrons, RPG Paper Crafts, Charming Grenade, Pretty Boy, and Yuma, Dead Lizard, Lion, Sam, Ross, Lumpy Spuds, Drums, Scalia, Nick, Farty Mick, Butterpants, Blood Angel, Bronus, Baboon, Baboon, Nathan, Fast Like a Tortoise, and James. Thank you all very much for your support.